Hello. Good morning, Elif. Good morning, Afa. So good to see you. Such a joy to join you. And um, I'm sorry we can't be with each other in person. I know. <laughs> How have you been faring under lockdown? It's strange, isn't it? Every day is different. I mean, I don't know how is it with you, but some days I feel very down. Some other days I feel more energized. Maybe I have more belief in, in, in books, in storytelling. So it's, I, I think we all go through tunnels of anxiety uh, and we need to talk about emotions, particularly lots of negative emotions around and within us. And I find it important to be able to talk about them honestly. I agree. I think honesty is so important. And um, I know this isn't really what we're here to talk about, but as a writer, I'm so curious as to whether the idea of solitude and uh, kind of almost self-isolation must be something you're very familiar with. I know from having spoken to you in the past that you do shut yourself away for months at a time to write, but this is so different because it's been imposed by force. Is there anything about your, your, your solitary writing life that has equipped you to handle this in a way that maybe other people aren't? It, it's funny because um, people understandably assume that for writers it's a bit easier because, as you said, we're solitary creatures. And what I do is a, is a lonely task. I am very used to working on my own for weeks or months on end, but this is so different. Mm -hmm. And also, I love literary festivals, public talks, and, and those open and diverse and democratic and, and spaces that we try to make more egalitarian. To me, that is, is, is incredibly important. And I miss literary festivals. I miss those, those gatherings. I, I'm, I'm aware that we're trying to do our best digitally, but it's not exactly the same thing. So there's a part of me that's really missing the book signings and, 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 and the meetings between writers and readers. Um, but I think at a more existential level almost, you find yourself questioning, what am I doing? You know, the, the, the story that I'm, that I'm writing, does it really matter right now? When people are dying in tens of thousands, when there's so much injustice and inequality and suffering out there and everywhere, you sit down at your desk and then question yourself, does it really matter whether I found the perfect synonym, whether I found the comma from this line to the next line? So I think you go that kind of almost existential questioning as well. Well, there's almost two layers really to the responsibility and the, and the burden because you are uh, a booker, shortlisted author, world celebrated. I have read and enjoyed so many of your novels and I know I will continue to in future, but also because of your platform and your activism and your willingness to speak out about oppression and injustice, you are also a voice who people look up to because of, but also in addition to your writing. Does that give you a sense when we're in times like this of such turbulence and such injustice, a sense that you want to act or speak, or do you feel that you should always respond with your writing? I think for a long time I've had this feeling, if you happen to be a storyteller coming from a wounded democracy, from a broken democracy, such as Turkey, but also the, the examples, the list of examples countries is so long and getting longer from Brazil to Hungary, from Venezuela to the Philippines, you know, and every, every year we have more, more countries unfortunately added to that list. So if you happen to be a writer from wounded democracies, I don't think you have the luxury of being apolitical. I don't think you have the luxury of saying, you know, I, I only want to talk about my own stories, my own novels or imagination. I really don't want to talk about what's happening outside the window. You can't say that if so much is happening outside the window. Also, I am a feminist. And one of the many wonderful things that I have learned from women's movements of past generations is that politics is not only about the parliament, political parties, or what the prime minister might be doing at this moment. It is much more diffuse than that. We have to look at power relations. So wherever there's power hierarchy, there is politics. And in that regard, the personal is also political. So you might be writing about sexuality, you might be writing about gender discrimination, that too is quite political. So if you define politics in that broad way, again, you can't be non-political. My feeling is, particularly after 2016, I think more and more Western authors have begun to feel that kind of emergency, you know, the urgency to, to 
to speak up about politics, what's happening, which is not an easy thing for us because Doris Lessing has this beautiful statement. She says, literature is analysis after the event. You need some time to pass. You need to digest, process. And I understand that. But sometimes, especially in the days we're living in right now, literature has to be analysis during the event as well. And I think that's, that's the challenge we're all experiencing. Let's talk more about that. But first, I know we have a lot of school pupils joining us today. And it's so wonderful that we can still talk to you all even though we can't meet in person. And I know you know who Elif is, and I certainly do, but I just thought it might be useful to talk a little bit about who you are, what you do in your journey, and I'll introduce myself as well. So after this, all go away and read all of Elif's books. Um, I won't reveal which my favorites are because I want you to read them all, but she is uh, the most widely read author in Turkey and she writes, remarkably in Turkish and in English. I'm still struggling to comprehend how English is not your first language because of the quality and the uh, magic of your writing in English, Ali. She's published 17 books, 11 of which are novels, and your work has been translated into 50 languages. Um, and you hold a PhD in political science and you've taught um, at universities in Turkey, the US and the UK, including St Anne's College, Oxford, where you're an honorary fellow. And just to introduce myself, my name is Afwa Hirsch. I'm a writer, a journalist, and a broadcaster. I published my book, Brit-ish, on race, identity, and belonging in 2018. It's a book about my personal experience of trying to make sense of my Britishness as a black woman, but it's also an analysis of Britain's history of race, of structural unfairness, and how it shaped our contemporary reality. I also write a column in The Guardian. I do a lot of um, broadcasting. I do news broadcasting, but I also present documentaries. And my book, British, is currently being made into a TV drama, which hopefully you'll be able to see next year. Um, and I was also a judge on the Booker Prize last year, which uh, one of the judges who shortlisted Elif's latest book um, as, uh, a, a shortlisted book for that prize, which meant I, I had the joy of reading it three times, uh, which, was <laughs> which was a wonderful treat. So um, our paths have crossed a few times before because the first time I met you when I was truly in awe of you, Elif, was at a Penguin event, which was encouraging writers from disadvantaged backgrounds, writers who traditionally haven't found a ready platform in the publishing industry to be able to write and be published by publishers like Penguin. And uh, I think I was supposed to be there as an author who was also imparting my wisdom, but really I was there to learn from authors like you um, from whom I learned so much. But maybe it would be good to just start if you could talk really briefly about your journey and how you became the writer and also the figure that you are today, who is so synonymous with standing up against human rights abuses, injustice, um, the patriarchy in Turkey, but globally as well. So is there any way you could speak briefly, Elif, about how your writing and your platform have evolved at the same time? I, I, I so appreciate everything you said. You know, it means a lot to me coming from you as, as I have so much respect for your voice. And, and I find your, um, your voice increasingly important, increasingly needed, especially in the world we are living. So it means a lot to me, everything you said. Yeah. If I may share with you a small story, I used to go to schools a lot in Turkey when I used to live in Istanbul, and I would speak with students of different age groups. And I've learned a lot from that experience. And when you speak to a seven-year-old or eight-year-old Turkish or, or um, child, or any child actually around the world. It's just fascinating to see how much chutzpah they have, how much courage they have, and how much self-confidence they have. And if you ask in a room full of young children, is there anyone in this room who would like to become a novelist one day or a poet? So many hands will go up. But then I would go to high schools, and these are children who are older, who have um, gone through puberty, and things have changed. One of the things that struck me was nobody would want to become a writer or a poet anymore, you know, in uh, among high school students. 
But also one other thing that stayed with me, girls become timid. You know, the, the girls that were very confident because if, if you talk to a seven-year-old, eight-year-old girl, um, they, they have equal confidence, if not even more confidence than boys at that age. But then through years of school um, at the family, in the neighborhood, we teach these girls to, lead, to lose their confidence. So to me, the difference was incredibly striking. That's a question that I ask myself. How do we remember the courage we had as children, that limitless energy uh, we had, ambitions we had as children, and how do we manage not to lose that? Because we live in a society of inequalities that always tells us just to blend in, do not stand out, do not speak too much because other people will judge you. And we're very much afraid of the judgment, the gaze of the society. And I think that pulls us down all the time. It also is an obstacle in front of our creativity because in order to produce art, you need to dare to speak up. Uh, that's why I always remember the, my experience with, with, with schools. And I don't want girls to, to become timid, you know, we, we have to speak up, speak out. And the only way to do that is by listening to each other and to learning from, from by learning from each other. That, that, there was um, some research done in Britain, which I wrote about last year, which looked at women, um, at, at girls at school and both their performance, but also their, how they, identified their self, their level of self-confidence. And then it tracked them through university and into the workplace. And what was so heartbreaking was that at school in Britain, girls um, were performing better than boys and had more confidence. And that continued at the beginning of the university. But by the time they were in the workplace, by the end of the first year at work, their confidence had, had um, been completely eviscerated and that they, you really saw a change that being in the workplace and having gone to university had been devastating for their self-confidence and their vision of what they could do with their lives, you know, and whether that was in the professional, in the creative field. And it really made me think about the systemic factors, about what it is about our society that is almost destroying the confidence of girls and women, because it, it felt when you see it on that macro scale, that it's not also that, some of these girls and had very inspiring women in their own lives and had big dreams and had resources and privilege but even if you factor all that in there were so many you could see who were moving in the wrong direction and that has to say something about the way our society works and the ways that our systems and our institutions psychologically attack the confidence and the aspirations of women yes and i think this this discussion is particularly important even more so right now, because with the pandemic, we have seen women have always been at the front lines, right? Uh, forefront of the fight against the virus. Around 70% worldwide of healthcare workers are women. But when you look at people in senior positions, decision-making positions, a very small minority are women. So women are delivering the service, the fight against the virus, but not necessarily taking the decisions and I think we need to be aware of the fact that unfortunately, after the pandemic, with unemployment, with economic problems and recession, uh, women will be suffering more. Women are already holding underpaid and undervalued jobs. And these will be the first jobs that will disappear. So we need a gender conscious approach if we want to solve the problems of the day. We can't be gender blind. And we also have to think about race and ethnicity. And I know you and I think about these things in an intersectional way. I don't know if you saw, but yesterday, um, this, the British government released its report on why ethnic minority people have been disproportionately affected by COVID. Although unfortunately the report didn't reveal why, it simply affirmed that they have. But my, I think my biggest critique of the response to COVID has been the failure to take into account that disproportionate effect and at, offer advice, guidance, and requirements as to how to protect people. If you know that um, black men or Asian women are more likely to die from COVID as an employer, as a health service, you need to take steps to protect them. I mean, that seems simple to me. If you had pregnant employees, you wouldn't expose them to certain things that were dangerous given their vulnerability. And I feel that the complete lack of leadership is continuing to put people from ethnic minority backgrounds at risk of dying from this pandemic 
at totally disproportionate levels. And it compounds this week as well with what's started in America, but has spread globally after the murder of George Floyd and just the anger that's been unleashed. And I think many of us know that this is not a new anger. It's very ancient anger and something that many of us have been grappling with all our lives. How have you been navigating what's happening at the moment? And, 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 and do you have any thoughts about what our response could be? Yeah, we, we have been told that the, the pandemic, the virus was a big equalizer. And at the first glance, it seems to be so, because at the first glance, it seems like the virus is affecting everyone, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, or, or gender, it seems to be. But when you look at the data, when you scratch the surface and take a closer look, that is not the case at all. This is not a big equalizer. Just the opposite, what the pandemic has done is to reveal the existing inequalities and fractures within our social systems and political systems. These inequalities already existed. You know, it's nothing new. We're just beginning to see, um, or, or it has become all the more obvious with, with the pandemic. And, and I find it incredibly important to have this conversation. I think inequality cannot be a footnote at the end of the page. From now on, and we're already late, but from now on, it has to be at the center of all of our debates, even in advanced democracies, even in a, in, in a, in a city like London. If you happen to live in a wealthier area, as opposed to a more disadvantaged community, your chances of getting the, contracting the virus and dying from the virus are much, much lower. So put it differently, if you're already in a disadvantaged community, um, your chances of dying from the virus is, is much, much higher. So we cannot ignore this uh, inequality. And our approach has to be conscious of, of this fact. I understand anger and, and I think, sometimes I think if you're not angry, if you're not frustrated, if you're not worried, maybe you're not following what's happening in the world, you know, here, there and everywhere. So in a way for me, when I look at anger, I see it also as a response to injustices, to inequalities, and also something different than, in, you know, numbness. What, what worries me is numbness. When we become numb to each other's pain, when we stop caring, when we become disconnected, disengaged, atomized, that really scares me because then terrible things have happened in, in history. So it is better that we're engaged, connected, follow what's happening, engage in these conversations. But that said, I also think about how we can channel anger into a much more constructive energy. Because the problem with anger in the long run is that it becomes repetitive, it can be very corrosive. And I think we need to be very careful about violence. You know, violence cannot be allowed. So there are these difficult conversations that we also should be able to have. For me, it's very important that we mobilize we, we organize our voices, we go out and speak up and speak out. Toni Morrison has this beautiful um, essay in which she talks about her anger. She says, I get so angry and then I speak up and then I sit at my desk and I work and I work. So we have to channel our anger into something much more constructive that hopefully makes a difference in our, in, in our lives, but primarily in the lives of others. I feel like an area we have a lot to learn from you, Elif, is the uh, response of authorities to try and silence. Yeah. And I have felt throughout my career, ever since I began speaking about race, and like you were saying about the activism you have kind of found yourself in, for me also, it was not really an option. It wasn't something I set out to do, but I found that when I saw injustice, when I saw racial injustice and gender injustice, uh, there were forces that didn't want me to speak. And there were so many people who said that to identify unfairness and speak about it and call it out and name it is race baiting or it's divisive. And there are these subtle ways in Britain that people try and shut down an analysis that makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I feel as if in a very extreme way, this is something that you have so gracefully been dealing with the ugliness of that attempt to silence, you know, by speaking and the way that you create characters who are from ethnic minority backgrounds in Turkey, the way that you talk about the oppression of journalists and the shutdown of free speech and the persecution of feminists, it's often in the face of very scary 
hostility and, and, and threatening attempts to silence you. So do you have any thoughts about how in this moment when it feels like there is an opening, I feel yeah. as if there is an opening right now because people who have been deaf to this struggle are now being forced to listen. Yeah. And that's where this anger has actually served us. It's opened up a space that sometimes um, the status quo can never do. But that moment now where the anger is there, the space is opening and we need to channel it, has to be done sometimes in the face of continuing attempts to silence us or to water down our message. Do you have any guidance as to how we can navigate that and keep our safety and our integrity intact? Yes, indeed. And I think we, we we're constantly learning, aren't we? I find it very important that we do not remain silent. We need to speak up. We need to understand what's happening. You know, not that long ago, a young woman in America, in her sleep, she has been shot by police officers. We did not hear her story. You know, when you learn what's happening, then you connect. So it's information, the flow of information, the flow of knowledge. I find that incredibly important. We have all witnessed a murder, all of us watching the video, um, the killing of George Floyd. And I agree with you, there is a moment right now. It's not a moment, it's a movement right now. You know, there is an opening, something is shifting. It is shifting because more people are speaking up and we cannot lose this momentum. My worry is if we let anger be the only guiding force, we can lose this momentum. So you need anger is not a good friend in the long run, but definitely um, it is incredibly justified, understandable. We just need other friends, other companions. We need wisdom and wisdom comes from stories. Wisdom comes only when we can bring together the mind and the heart. You know, wisdom comes with empathy, but wisdom also comes with humility. Just to realize, wait a minute, I don't know. I haven't experienced it in the same way. I'm not black. I have a lot to learn from a black woman, what her experience is like, you know? I need to listen. It's not my moment to speak right now. It's my moment to listen. So, so you see, we need, we need also humility. We live in a world in which we have forgotten to say, I don't know. When was the last time we said, I don't know? If we don't know anything, we just Google it. In the next five minutes, we think we know the subject, but we don't. So I find it incredibly important that, yes, we keep reading, connecting, communicating, going out, speaking up, writing about this. But also, I think the crucial thing is to listen to the voices of minorities who have been experiencing this since the day they were born and throughout generations. So there are lots of stories that we need to listen at this moment in time. And I would say everyone has their role to play. As you were saying, we need our storytellers. You know, we need to write our own stories and have uh, an ability to influence our own narrative, but we need our leaders too. And we need institutions to listen. And one of the things that I have found powerful about this is to see police officers kneeling. And that is something that I have not seen before. And it doesn't solve anything in and of itself. But the symbolism of that, I think, reflects what you're saying, a willingness to listen and be humble. And that is necessary, if not sufficient for change. I just want to let everyone watching know that the comment feed is now open for your questions. And we'll be answering them soon. Refresh um, the page if you can't see it. And I just want to move the conversation on. So please, that's to encourage you, send us questions. We wanna to talk to you, we wanna hear from you. We want to bring you into this conversation. Um, and Alif, I wanted to talk a little bit, given our audience about what young people can do. And just to share something I saw yesterday, it was an extract from the Tampa Tribune in 1942, I think it was. And it was an essay competition, um, which had been entered by a young black girl in Florida. And she had been asked to write an essay along with all these other young people about what a suitable punishment for Hitler would be at the end of the war. And she wrote, let him put on a black skin and live the rest of his life in America. And I thought how profound a thing for a teenager to say. And the fact that her words have survived all these ages, it's such a simple, an absolutely devastating indictment of what it is like to be black in America. And it made me also think of how powerful a young person's voice can be. That was an essay competition that she entered in the 1940s and we're still talking about 
those words and just how incredibly they cut to the heart Absolutely. the scale of pain and suffering and injustice that African Americans have endured for so many generations. What can we offer young people as advice and how can we listen to them too because they have so much to teach us and it's a crowded space now on social media everyone has a voice it makes it harder for people to cut through absolutely absolutely and you know it's this is a very hierarchical the societies that we are living they have so many hierarchical divisions and it's not easy to be a member of a minority it's not easy to be young it's not easy uh, to be disempowered. So all these layers upon layers of hierarchies that we need to unravel. And, and for that, to understand that we need to listen to each other. If I may give you maybe an indirect answer, there is a place in Istanbul that has motivated me when I was writing my, my latest novel, uh, as you know, it's, it's an actual graveyard. It's, it's called the Cemetery of the Companionless. That would be the, the translation and I became very interested in this place because it's a very much forgotten place. I think a writer's job is not only to chase stories, but also to chase silences. And when you go to that place, you realize there are no names, no surnames written on graveyards, on, on, on tombstones, but just numbers, you know, on wooden posts. And when the numbers disappear, everything disappears. So I started doing research, who are the people who have been actually buried here? And when you do that, you realize many of them are minority members. They have been rejected by their families. So there are lots of sexual minorities buried there. They haven't been given a proper burial. There are uh, also a growing number of refugees. Every day in our newspapers, we read about refugees who have drowned as they were trying to cross the sea into Europe. Uh, where are all these bodies taken? So it's a very sad place, this cemetery, where an Afghan refugee, a Syrian refugee, might be buried um, next to a Kurdish or Turkish LGBTQ member. And I wanted as a writer to reverse the process because it is a place in which actual human beings are turned into numbers. And I think our job is to reverse that process this, this, it's a discourse that dehumanizes people. We need to rehumanize. And the only way to do that is through stories. To me, it's very essential that we do this together. I call it water families. I think in life we have two families. We have our blood families, which is if, if our blood families are kind and tender, that's a blessing. Not everyone is as lucky. But remember, as we keep living, we also are going to have our water families. And our water families are composed of our friends. And those friends can come from all backgrounds. You know, These are the witnesses of our journeys. Why do I find this important? Because in societies where democracy is lost or where appreciation of diversity is lost or where there isn't proper equality, I think it's very important that people who are marginalized support each other, empower each other. So I find it very important that we keep our water families alive and I find it very important that we have global solidarity and particularly the global system at this moment in time. It's such a beautiful idea, water families. And what you said also reminded me of another uh, thing that I'm very passionate about, which is curiosity. Curiosity. Yeah. To yeah. go to a graveyard and have enough curiosity to see and hear the silence and, and, and think about the lives and the humanity of the people who are there. And as a journalist as well, I feel that curiosity is some, it, it sounds almost um, so small, but it's a foundation. And if, if we had all been more curious, I think, about the structures and systems we'd inherited in this society, we would be further along the path to dismantling them. Yeah. But so many people who benefit from the status quo have been content not to ask questions about the people who maybe aren't in their own lives. They've been able to leave the suffering and the unfairness over there and stay in a bubble. And I think that anything that begins to burst that bubble and jog people out of complacency and, and trigger that curiosity, it might feel painful, but it's a good thing. It's good to move through life with curiosity and humility and interest in other people's stories. Absolutely, and curiosity is so precious. We mentioned it earlier very briefly, but when I read the memoirs of people who have survived the darkest chapters in, in, in human history, including the Holocaust, genocide, civil wars, 
almost all of them are asking us a very crucial question. How is it possible that such atrocities can occur on such a large scale? Is it because human beings are bad by nature? Is it because most of us are evil? And that is not the case at all. There are some evil people, but their numbers are very small. So how is it possible that widespread injustice can happen then? And the answer that the survivors are giving us, they're saying, be careful about apathy, you know, about numbness, indifference, because if we lose our curiosity, if we stop asking, but why is it like that? Why is this happening? What is behind this? The moment we stop engaging, caring about each other's pain and numbness settles in, then very few bad people can do enormous damage. So I find it incredibly important that we're aware that actually apathy and indifference are the most dangerous emotions at, at this moment. Such a powerful message. We've got our first question from a student. Um, Social media has educated people and become a platform to spread the word on the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. Do you think trends such as Blackout Tuesday takes away the focus on the real issue here? So that's really a question about whether we gain, is there a net gain from these social media movements and, and do they sometimes run the risk of becoming gimmicks? I know that there was a lot of criticism of Blackout Tuesday that it was actually obscuring the very valuable messages, what grassroots organizations to support, how to donate money to bail funds that can help people who've been arrested while protesting, how to engage in the movement that is trying to change the systemic unfairness. But at the same time, sometimes symbolism is powerful too. So how do we navigate that, Ellie? Yeah. And how much do you use social media as well? Yeah, I do. I do use. But I, what I have learned coming from a country like Turkey uh, is not to generalize social media in, in simplistic terms, because I think it's a bit like the moon, isn't it, social media? It definitely has a bright side and then it has a very dark side. And we need to talk about both. What do I mean by the bright side? I think it is important. We connect, and especially in countries where freedom of speech is lost, Sometimes social media becomes our source of information. This is how we learn what is happening elsewhere or, even, or here in front of our eyes. Sometimes we don't know. So in terms of flow of information connecting us, I find it important. I come from the Middle East where in the public space, women do not have equality. And I have seen many young Middle Eastern women finding another voice for themselves in the digital space. So there's no way I can underestimate that. Um, however, there's also the dark side of the digital technologies that we need to be aware of, including slander, hate speech, misinformation. We need to be incredibly careful about not spreading misinformation and also not staying in our echo chambers. We do not learn anything from echoes. Echoes are repetition. They don't have light. They don't have light. So I, I think in this life, if we're going to learn anything at all, we're going to learn from people who are different than us. And that is incredibly important, therefore, to keep diversity in our conversations, public spaces alive. Now, coming back to um, particularly this week's social media feeds, I think we need to bear in mind that, that we need to remember again and again, racism is nothing new. It is so deeply rooted. It is so pervasive. But we often did not hear what was happening. So social media does play an important role in mobilizing, organizing and spreading the stories but we should also be careful about staying away from hate speech, slander and misinformation. I could not agree more. Um, we could have a whole conversation about the role <laughs> of social media providers and platforms to regulate that, but that's a whole other conversation. And we do have another question. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the most important thing that everyone can do to combat inequality in day-to-day -day life, particularly young people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say, first of all, to become listeners. This is something that I have learned, uh, you know, as, as a novelist over the years. I think novelists need to be two things primarily. We need to be good readers and we need to be good listeners all our lives. So in a way, we need to be students of life and never stop learning. Learning never ends. That means we need to meet with people from different backgrounds, you know, see what they're experiencing, listen to them. Young people do not have an equal voice in our societies. 
And I find it very important that we create open, egalitarian, democratic, diverse spaces in which everybody feels welcome. And we need to monitor our digital spaces. You know, we need to be very careful about the amount of hatred and discrimination that is being also produced in the digital spaces. We can't be uh, careless about, about that. I agree. And I think your advice to listen is so important. I've noticed how many people at the moment want to speak, want to express, yeah. um, but many people aren't versed in this struggle and also can learn so much from what's gone before. And I think we often have the tendency, don't we, to want to reinvent the wheel. We yeah. can always learn. There are people who have spent a lifetime fighting these injustices already. We all need to learn, listen, and be strategic, I think, as well. And I would say to young people, harness your energy and your passion, but we've got to try and use it strategically. It's not always useful to just act without thinking. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and if we all start to think together and build, plan, mobilize, organize, come together in groups and actually listen to each other and think, I think that we can start to work out paths to longer change. And that is really what interests me here, because I know we're angry and I know we're suffering and I know we're protesting and we should be and we will continue to. But the thing that we haven't been able to do is to build. And that is what I would really like to see this anger be harnessed somehow into. Um, a next question. But if I, may I add a small thing? So, yeah, of course. I found what you said so, so important. And I think we also learn from ghosts, if I may put it this way, don't we? People who have fought so hard all their lives and written about it and spoken about it. So, as you said, we don't need to invent the wheel right now. There is a continuity. This, actually, the, the rights that we relatively enjoy today, they're all the outcome of the struggles of women and men who have gone through this um, way before. For me personally, it was incredibly important when I lived in America, um, when I lived in Boston, Mount Holyoke, the whole year reading about African-American women's movement of 1960s and 70s, it opened up my eyes. When you read people like Audre Lorde, and there's always an emphasis on multiplicity in her voice. She says, you know, look at me, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm lesbian, I'm a poet, I'm this, I'm that. And I'm many more things that you might not be able to see at first glance. I contain multitudes. So I find it very important that we always also emphasize that we all contain multitudes. We have multiple belongings. If we can do that, as opposed to exclusive identities, there's a bigger chance that we find a common ground and what we have in common. So to me, uh, a manifesto for multiplicity, fight for multiplicity is equally important and it's part of freedom. Couldn't agree more. And I found myself reading so many African-American women this week, yeah. Audre Lorde, Bell yeah. Hooks, yeah. Maya Angelou, Angela Davis, yeah. Toni Morrison, just the wisdom and the scholarship and the power of the words that they've already given us, we should be drawing on that. And I think you're so right. And this does actually lead into the next question because as you were speaking about these movements, I wanted to say, why don't we all learn about these movements in school? What better foundation can we offer young people than to engage with the people who've come before them who have already helped to change the world? And they have done the work and they've, and they've not only done it, but they've written it for us to read. And I also turn to the independence movements of the mid of the 20th century. I read Kwame Nkrumah, I read Patrice Lumumba. These were scholars who were incredibly intellectual, had built remarkable ideologies, but on top of that, they acted. They led their nations to independence from colonial rule. And that is such a powerful combination. So I feel as if, we need to tap into the voices that our curricula have silenced in the past. And it often sounds like a simple thing, change the curriculum, change education. But what we're really saying is unlock the wisdom of people who have dedicated their lives to these struggles already. And let's not have to start all over again from the beginning. So the next question was, schools spend a great deal of time teaching outdated issues. Do you think it's time to change the curriculum and educate children on issues like black history? and racial oppression? Well, I've kind of answered where I'm yes. on that. What are your thoughts, Ellie? And I, and, I, and I fully agree. I think 
history books, they, 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 they're always written, you know, top down, one official narrative. And, and to me, as an author, this, it's incredibly important to, to challenge this and to ask seemingly small questions. I'll give you an example from uh, the country where I come from. Like when I go to Tur uh, when I went to school in Turkey, I only learned a very nationalistic interpretation of history. And then you ask yourself, yes, but what about his story? What about her story? And then you realize there's no room for that in our textbooks. So if I, how would I live? How would my life be like um, if I had been an Armenian silversmith in 17th century Ottoman Empire? or a concubine, you know, a woman sold, or if you were a Jewish miller. So when you ask these questions about micro histories, then you realize the entire history that we're learning is constantly censoring and erasing, you know, people's, people's truth. And so for us, I think it's very important that we change our curriculum, but we cannot only wait for that, we need books. And that is why it is wonderful to have bookstores, independent bookstores. You walk into a bookstore, you find books, journalists, novelists, scholars, historians who are telling, wait a minute, there's another story that our curriculum doesn't mention. And that story is worth knowing. That is why I think education should be definitely accompanied by um, books and, and, and also investigative journalism. I feel passionately about that. And I would also say when it comes to the question of education and the curriculum, I like to think about it deeply. And I think it's what's on the curriculum, but really it's about what is our education system designed to do? And I think when you look at the history of our education systems, you see they were designed to preserve power. They were designed to preserve the power structures that already existed. They were not designed to create new generations who could disrupt and dismantle systems of unfairness. And that really, for me, goes to the root of why we don't learn black history in Britain, why we don't learn the histories of working class people in Britain, why women have been erased from history in Britain. And the same is true of so many other countries and the ways in which all of those histories overlap. And in Britain, it's certainly the case that our education system has not been designed to tell people the truth. It's been designed to produce people who continue to uphold the system that we have. And so I think if we want to be really radical, we need to think very deeply about why we have designed it this way. And in a way, I think if you wanted to design something from scratch that could educate future citizens to create a fair society, you would build something very different from what we currently have. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, we need to be aware of, of, of that. But also, I think, in addition, we need to be aware of our language, the words we use. Um, because discrimination, systematic discrimination, history has shown us, it doesn't start with, you know, gas chambers, it doesn't start with, with killings, it, it in fact starts with words, you know, discrimination always starts with words, so we need to be careful about how we talk, when we, when we talk about minorities, the words that we use, the words that have been taught to us, mm -hmm. this week, I, I, I don't know if, if uh, the students who are listening to us had a chance to read about this, but there was a big march in Hungary, uh, a, a far right march that worries me immensely because they're trying to kick out the Romani minority and out of the country, this, this is their home. And the language that they were using throughout this march, for them, the Romani minority are not humans. They are, they are not even inferior humans. They use words like vermin, as if they're infesting the country. So as a writer, I'm also, also constantly thinking about language, how we're using words. We need to radically change um, and, and, and question the language uh, and the way words are being used to discriminate people. So important. Um, the next question we have is, what do you think is the best approach to educate a closed-minded person on inequality and the struggles people face? I'd just like to, if I can, say something personal about that. Um, I don't know about you, Elif, but I, I think a lot of people at the moment are being contacted by people they know who maybe haven't thought about these issues before and are now asking us to educate them. And I think it's very positive when people know that they need to learn. But I would always say it's not my job to relive 
my experiences of racism or trauma or to perform some kind of version of blackness on demand for people who now want to tap into it. And what I would say instead is that there are books. There are so many books that people have written that can educate you, that can open your mind, that can show you someone else's perspective, that can really teach you about the society you live in but never saw clearly. And that is, for me, why we write these books. It's certainly why I wrote my book. It's why other colleagues of mine, um, Renia Do Lodge, it's why she wrote Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. It's why Akala wrote Natives. There are so many of these books that you can read and I urge you to read them. And if you know somebody who needs to read one, don't be afraid to recommend a book to them, but don't feel like it's your job to educate everybody who hasn't thought about these issues before. And Alif, what would you say to someone trying to approach someone who hasn't really been in this conversation in the past? I think what I like is the clarity of our thinking and compassion of, of the heart. If we can combine these, I believe that's a very powerful combination. We need to bear in mind that sometimes people genuinely don't know anything. And I've experienced this in Turkey when you talked with people about Armenian genocide, it didn't happen that long ago, but many people genuinely do not know anything because at school they haven't learned in their families. This has never even been mentioned. So we need to be a bit patient, you know? Compassion is, is incredibly important. We need to also understand that we ourselves don't know the story. So I'm learning, as I'm learning, I'm sharing. It's, it's an endless, endless journey. Every nation state in this world has its own official version of history. But the difference, so in that regard, they're almost all the same. But the difference between a country where there is democracy and where there isn't democracy is in a democracy, you can go to a bookstore and you can find books that challenge, openly question the official version of history that we're being taught at school. And the writers of those books are not prosecuted or, or, or jailed. So in this country, we can go to bookstores uh, and, and find those books. And I, as like you, I agree, we need to educate ourselves constantly. Books would be my primary reference, but also listening to each other. If you have friends, and, and that's, that's a wonderful treasure from diverse backgrounds, just to listen, you know, what have they gone through and, and share it. We always learn from those conversations. If I may quickly add this, as a novelist, what I have experienced is I have many readers in Turkey who come from very ultra conservative worldviews. You know, if you, if you ask their opinion about minorities, they will tell you lots of stereotypes. Equally, I have many homophobic readers because this is the only narrative they have heard at school, at school or, or in their houses. But then they come and they say, you know, I read your book and this is the character that I love the most. And maybe the character they're talking about is Armenian or Jewish or Greek. Or maybe the character they're talking about is gay or bisexual or transgender. I ask, out of curiosity, what brings them to your books? Are they deliberately seeking to open their minds or do they, uh, do they not realize what they're going to get when they read it? But sometimes it's curiosity. You know, you just want to follow the story. And then in that story, you meet um, a character you would be normally biased against in the public space. I guess what I would like to say is, we are always less tolerant, less open-minded when we are constantly in the company of people who are not open-minded and intolerant. Human beings, energy is contagious, but when we are alone, when we go into that inner garden, into that individual space, and when we are reading a novel or a book, we retreat into another zone of individuality. And in that space, there's a bigger chance that we can connect with, with humanity. So just to stay away from um, tribes who are, that are intolerant, you know, if all my friends are biased against minorities, I will start speaking in the same way. Just be careful about the kind of discourse that you're being subject to throughout the day. I think that's also important. I agree. And pick your friends carefully because the people that you choose to spend your time with will shape you. And that can be an incredibly positive thing. If you surround yourself with people who have passion and energy and are generous and humble, then you will also take on those traits. And if you surround yourself with people who are disinterested and closed minded, then that will affect you in ways you can't even imagine as well. Um, 
I wish we could talk longer, Ellie. Cheers. But it's time to wrap up. So I want to thank you so much for your time. And I want to say to everybody watching who's at school, if you are completing the activity sheet, the color of the talk is plum. I wish we had activity sheets with some plum, Ellie. Um, and make sure you subscribe to the Penguin platform channel for book chat, book giveaways, and all the Penguin's teen and young adult books. And if you'd like a free audiobook download of my book, Brit-ish, and Alif's book, The Architect's Apprentice, please fill in the short feedback survey, the link for which is in the description below. And there's a link for other anti-racism book recommendations. I mentioned some of them, but there are many more excellent books on anti-racism that are very prescient right now. And if you want to learn more about the issues we've discussed today, I urge you to read them. Thank you so much for watching. Elif, you've been so generous with your time and it's just wonderful for me to see you. It feels a little bit like the world as it was when we could talk and have these conversations. Um, although I also hope that next time I see you, the world will be different because yeah. that's what I think we're all striving for. Exactly. And we don't want to go back to the normal, you know, we want to create a new world indeed. This has been such a pleasure for me and it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so all much. so much for watching and for your brilliant questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but I think for me, when I've write, I speak to young people and we get questions that show all of those things, intellectual curiosity, humility, a hunger to learn and passion and energy, then that personally gives me hope. So thank you all very much for watching. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.